So it's interesting, we were talking about the opioid crisis right. um, when you were running for mayor and you were still waiting to get the nomination. And that was the first time I learned that you were in recovery yourself. Right. It's interesting because some politicians come right out with it, with whatever their personal story might be, that they think voters can kind of feel for. Mm. So why talk about this today? You know, I, as a candidate and in the past, I never talked about it much because I didn't ever want to feel like I was using it for political advantage or something. And like you speak about, you know, as a as a moment to connect. But the, the reality is, is uh, a lot of who I am is uh, rooted in the, some of the values and lessons and community that I found in recovery. And uh, more than ever, I think individuals who might be struggling with addiction and, and equally importantly, families who have a loved one who's struggling, um, I think need to hear stories of, of hope and recovery as much as they need to hear about the services that we're providing mm -hmm. or the strategies that are in place, because uh, there is such a, an emotional human uh, element to this. How long have you been in recovery for? About 22 years. 22 years. Yeah. What does it feel like to say that out loud? That's a long time. <laughs> it's a huge number. <laughs> it's a big yeah. number. No, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's beyond my expectations. And uh, I think in the first 90 days, um, mm -hmm. If you had said, you know, you're going to be clean and sober for 22 years, I would have called you crazy. Really? But, you know, one year turns into five years, and five years turns into 10 years, and the next thing you know, it's 22 mm. years. Um, but, you know, I still surround myself with people who are in recovery as well, and, and that's really important to kind of keep it fresh because while uh, I'm certainly proud of the fact that, that it's been a long time, I'm not um, smug or arrogant to think that. I couldn't uh, start using again tomorrow because that's how this thing works. And I've seen it in other people who had many, many years under their belt mm -hmm. and people with days under their belt. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it really is a day-by-day -day, uh, situation. Recovery for you was with alcohol abuse? My drug of choice was alcohol. Uh, it was primarily uh, abused alcohol, although um, there were other drugs, kind of whatever was available, but mm -hmm. it was primarily alcohol. And when did it start for you? Was there a moment that kind of triggered the abuse, or was it more gradual, like it is for some people? No, I, I, I describe my using time as a, a short but vibrant career. Mm. Uh, the, <laughs> I, I was like the perfect kid in high school and, uh, and never got in any trouble, and then the minute I went away for college, mm -hmm. um, I, I went nuts and, uh, and found that, you know, I, at, at first it was actually hard for me because I was drinking like a lot of freshmen in college right. drink, and I didn't think I was any different. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, this is just a phase that people go through. And then, this is freshman year? Yes. And then I realized that, you know, my, my peers in school, they weren't, they weren't using the way I was using. And, and what I've come to realize over the years is it actually has nothing to do with the quantity mm -hmm. of drugs or alcohol that you consume. It's got much more to do with why do you use and how do you use. And for me it was um, to try to escape um, circumstances that I was in because I was chasing that feeling of numbness, uh, because I had some really deep-rooted um, uh, feelings of self-loathing and other things that um, alcohol became the the solution to, but the root problem was not the alcohol. Uh, mm. And so, and that's what, you know, I'm really happy to have found a community of people to help me work on that for so long. Day one of sobriety. Yeah. Did it involve rehab or did it involve you just stopping? Did it involve a partner, a friend telling yeah. you, I'm here for you, Let, let's figure out a personal plan? Yeah, so on a on a Sunday, I was at work by myself, and I, you know, I've always been a workaholic, and I used to pride myself on working harder than everybody else. Mm -hmm. and I actually said at the rally for recovery the other day that I had reached a point where I was breaking standards faster than I could lower them. Ah, and, and you uh, recognize that? Yeah. Well, so you know, I had all these things that I would never, that I would never do, and then I went and did them. Yeah. And one of them was that I would never drink at work. And uh, and so I found myself on a Sunday at work drinking at my desk. No one was there. I, I, it's sort of baffling to me today because I could have drank at home, but and where was uh, work on that this day? is in Chicago, in Chicago. Uh, which is where I grew up and mm -hmm. where I was living and working at the time. And I had some familiar with 12 step programs through a family member. And, uh, and I, I took this uh, kind of questions of you might have a problem with alcohol if quiz that I had Googled. And, uh, and you know, I, I'm the kind of person that if the thing said that if you had 
If you answered five of these questions, yes, you might have a problem. I probably would have given myself a pass if I'd answered seven or nine of them correct, because wow. you know the rules didn't really apply to me, mm, and I you thought were smarter than that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so I answered this thing. I don't remember now. It was like nine or eleven questions, and I answered almost all of them yes. And then oh, I get to okay. the bottom, and it says, if you answer any of these questions, yes, you might have a problem. And it's like I just couldn't. I, it was like the thing I couldn't rationalize or justify. Uh, and so the next day, I called my doctor. My, and said I needed help. My doctor referred me to a therapist. Uh, that was on a Monday. The therapist was Tuesday, and by Friday, I was going to uh, Northwestern University's outpatient rehab program. And, uh, and I was still at that point convinced, because I was only 22, 23 at the time, that I was going to meet with these nurses, and they were going to say, you're really too young. Right. And you're fine. <laughs> right. You're, right. You're too young. This you is just to hear where you're fine. at in life. It's going to be okay. Uh, and instead of that, what they said was, you can start tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and, and were you ready to start that, that night? You know, I, and I, I know you've talked to people in, uh, in recovery before. There was just this moment of willingness. Mm -hmm. And I can't entirely explain it, um, but I was in this moment of willingness where I just put one, front, one foot in front of another and kind of took the recommendations that were given to me. And uh, and so I went to a 12-step meeting that night. I did 30 days in an outpatient program. Uh, I became very active in 12-step programs and, uh, and kind of found my people. So when you came to Rhode Island yeah. and you were sober at that point, yeah. did you meet up with anybody by the name of Jim Gillen? I sure did. And what kind of impression did he make on you? So I didn't meet Jimmy when I first moved here. Mm -hmm. um, but um, some other friends who are well known in the recovery community, and Tom, including Tom Coderre, I met very early on. Um, at that point, by the time I was living here, I'd been sober uh, five or six years, and Tom started to get me more and more involved, in that, and I joined the board of Rye Cares, uh, which is when I met Jimmy, and he just had that, that force of nature, personality. Um, someone who was kind of impossible to say no to. <laughs> totally. and, uh, and so he got me involved in the board. It was the first time I went to the rally. Uh, and, uh, and we were, you know, I, there were people who knew him a lot longer than I did, but I, I feel blessed to have known him for a while before he passed. It's kind of fitting now that you're the mayor of the capital city here because Jim did a lot of things in Rhode Island that have really been national models now. Right. Do you look back on your time because he's not with us anymore and say, wow, that started in Rhode Island and I want to keep that legacy going? Uh, it's not just Jim. There's a whole community True. of people here, but, but it includes peer -peer Jim. Peer -based oh, absolutely. Program. The peer recovery coach, even. Um, now the national 988 crisis hotline right. really started as BH Link, uh, right. which is what you know was founded in the Raimondo administration with mm -hmm. Tom Coderre, um, the Rally for Recovery, which has become a national model. Um, you know we were uh, we were named early on by a group called Faces and Voices of Recovery mm -hmm. as a national hub. Um, there are many ways in which we've led the conversation and. Uh, and when I was working for Gina, we became a recovery-friendly workplace, uh, which is something I'm working on now in city in government. City Hall? And what does that look like? Uh, what it means is making sure it's really twofold. One, that people who are in recovery uh, have equal access to job opportunities here and understand. There's a lot of people who, uh, because of their past use, either overtly or they're just an implied sense that maybe they're not eligible, they shouldn't mm -hmm. apply, or this isn't for me. And so one is to make sure that we are proactive in stating that this is a recovery-friendly workplace and people in recovery are not just welcome to apply but can thrive in their employment here, uh, but then also to make sure that our, our existing employees understand what supports are available to them if, uh, if they're struggling with addiction, to know that there's resources and a supportive environment for their recovery here. When you were in your early 20s and going through so much, was it easy to talk to your family or not? Because some people tell me in recovery it's just so hard and if it wasn't for their friends, they would still be struggling. You know, it was interesting. So I mentioned I had a family member who uh, also struggled with addiction. And so in that respect, my family was familiar with the topic. Uh, what was so different, and I think is true from a lot of people I've met ever since, is from the outside, my life looked pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I, it looked like I was keeping it together. I had an apartment, I had a job, you know, and there's still this stigma about what an addict looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think my family was, it wasn't difficult to talk about what it means to struggle with addiction or to try to find recovery. Um, what they struggled with was, but everything looks okay. You know, like you look like you're keeping it together, and, and that's why I kind of remind myself and, and try to tell others that it's, it's, it's not about the quantity, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. of drugs and alcohol that you ingest. And it's not even necessarily about what the outside of your life looks like. It's an inside job. It's what are the feelings and thoughts that you're having that's causing you to drink or use. And certainly that was the case for me. Uh, and so that's what my family struggled with, mm -hmm. uh, wrapping their head around at the beginning. Almost like they couldn't believe it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you left Chicago and you came right to Rhode Island at that point? Uh, no, I had a, a stop in between? there were a couple of stops okay. in between. I wasn't sure I think yeah. there were a couple. Okay. <laughs> but when you got to Rhode Island, yeah. you found that your sobriety was still pretty solid and you were able to yeah. keep it together, if you will, right? Right, right? What message do you have for other people? Right now, we are in recovery month. Right. You're speaking at a very sensitive time. Right. And why are you speaking with me today? You know, I think... There's so much conversation, uh, you know, the things that we're doing as a city, as a state, as a country, there's all kinds of uh, uh, coverage about naloxone and overdose prevention and needle exchange and the safe use uh, or safe consumption center that might be opening here in Providence, Soon, right? right? Soon. Mm -hmm. All of which I support. Um, but the purpose of keeping people alive is so that they can find recovery. And, and I feel like maybe the recovery piece has been missing from some of the um, conversation. Um, and so that's why I feel compelled to speak out now, because it's not just about not dying from an overdose. Mm -hmm. It's about finding a better life. It's about and hope. It's about hope. hope it's about in the hope state. Exactly. Right? And and we know that for for people, sometimes they need a second chance, a third chance, a five hundredth chance, and a thousandth chance. Mm -hmm. You never know when that moment is of, of opportunity is gonna open, but we wanna make sure that we're there when it does and that people can find recovery because it recovery is possible. It happens. There are resources here to help, and, and a better life is out there for anyone who's struggling with drugs and alcohol. We're sitting in City Hall right now. Kennedy Plaza, we know, is a very mm -hmm. sensitive area when it comes to putting Narcan stations there and preventing overdoses in such a public place. Do you see that getting better in the next year or two with these new investments you're putting forward in the city? Uh, I hope so. I mean, it, it, it certainly feels a little bit like we're um, swimming against the tide. Mm -hmm. And we keep doing more, but we also know that there's more and more and more harmful and more potent drugs on the market. And so um, we are trying to engage every possible partner. We're working closely with the state and federal government. We're spending more money than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to continue to do so. Uh, but the the people who are selling drugs and mixing drugs, they're, you know, the, the um, additives are getting more and more harmful and more and more toxic. And so uh, it's a constantly evolving epidemic and we need to evolve with it regrettably. Where do you stand? Providence looks like it's going to be the first city yeah. where you can go somewhere, bring your drugs and legally take them knowing that somebody's there on the other side to lift you up or potentially get you into recovery if you meet with a peer recovery coach, right? You support this model. I do, although I don't want to say that I didn't have a lot of questions, because mm. I did. And uh, this came up as a candidate last year, and I spent some time with the researcher from Brown, who's really the expert on it, asking a thousand questions to get comfortable with it, because I had reservations and um, misconceptions like I imagine a lot of residents in Providence do. Uh, but I've become comfortable with it. First of all, I do think at the end of the day, we need to keep people alive. And, this and you is can just find them in these places, Exactly. Right? Project um, Weber Renew is signed up to be... Yeah, they're one of the kind of co-partners mm -hmm. uh, of the facility. And then uh, because there is a peer recovery coach on, on site, uh, and, I'll, and I reflect on personal experience that, uh, and I've kind of talked to people in, in my travels in recovery circles where uh, it's right after getting high or... Safe injection sites in general, we are good to go as far as one will open in Providence. Can you give us a timeline of when the first safe injection site will open in the capital city? Next year. Um, 2024. 2024, I think in the first half of next year. And we're looking to go into a neighborhood. You've identified a location, can't make it public yet, but it's somewhere where the need is. Is that fair to say? That's right. Again, the city's not running these, and so there's, there's a partnership with Weber Renew. They've identified a location. They're working through the permitting, insurance, all of that to make sure that it's a viable site. Uh, but the research from around the world, from the places that have had these, is that you want it to be located in a place where mm -hmm. addicts are. Um, you want to put it where the need is. And, uh, and, and after starting with a lot of questions, 
about this model and about this use and having those questions answered, I've become a, a, a supporter. Uh, it's important to note for residents and neighbors that this is a pilot, um, which, mm -hmm. you know, which means that funded. it's a test, it's a grant funded, we, in, and if the experiment fails, we won't continue it, but it's worth trying uh, to keep people alive and to try to help people find recovery, uh, particularly in that moment after they use, which is sometimes when that window opens. So similar to when the Providence Center or peer recovery coaches go into an emergency room after somebody's OD'd and they're there to kind of catch them and buy them some time to get into recovery. This is the same idea, right, but in the community versus in a hospital setting? That's right, and it's important to say that this isn't proselytizing. Right. We're not, um, you know, we're not seeking converts. It's having resources available to keep um, people alive. at that moment, uh, to keep people alive, and, uh, uh, and even, even aside from the recovery piece, one of the benefits of these um, safe consumption sites is if it's supervised, which it will be by a nurse or a nurse practitioner, um, you can often uh, reverse the effects of an overdose with simple oxygen mask. If, it, if you act quickly enough. By the time our EMS or other community partners respond to a, a potential overdose uh, in the city and we're administering Narcan, it's, it's past the point mm -hmm. where oxygen alone could and solve the problem. And now it's sometimes three doses of Narcan That's to bring right. anybody back. That's right. And so uh, this is a, a much safer and uh, less um, invasive way to ensure people are using safely and again matching them with resources on site in a in an environment that is supportive and uplifting and not in some sort of punitive or fear-based environment. So for people who have their doubts, is it fair for me to say that today by talking to me and your personal story of recovery, you're saying, I've been through it, listen to me at least take the chance, be open-minded? Is that a fair assumption? I think that's fair, although I wouldn't put it all on me. The reality is, is that... You're the first city, though. <laughs> people, are, <laughs> people are using. Mm -hmm. That's not going to change. People are dying. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to change. We need to try as many different strategies as possible. And this is a, a, a strategy that has worked in other places that I believe is worth trying here to keep our family members, our loved ones, our neighbors alive. And it's not just a place where they can use, it's a place that's matched with resources and so that we can provide help. And, and the part that I would infuse my personal experience mm. is, um, is that I have, through my lived experience, seen that sometimes the best moment to reach someone is right after they've used when they start to think about maybe I can't keep doing this. Uh, and that's why having these resources paired at that same moment has the potential to save, uh, save lives and get more people into recovery and off and break the cycle of addiction. We've been throwing so much more money at the opioid crisis, but this is a little bit different. Obviously, it takes funding to try this new pilot, but this is a new approach, and you're hoping it's going to work? I am hoping it's going to, it's going to work, and I will say that some of the funding is actually coming from the settlement that we mm -hmm. received right. from the opioid manufacturers, uh, which I think is just. Um, these, the Attorney General is very happy about that. Yeah, and, and it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, these companies made a killing off of killing, and, and so we're reinvesting those dollars to keep people alive. Um, and, uh, and I'm proud to, to try this new approach here in Providence. So when people hear your personal story of recovery, three things you'd like them to take away. Uh, again, it's not, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how much you use, it's an inside job. And so if you're in a place, either you've got a loved one or you yourself are in a place where um, you know what you're doing isn't, isn't, isn't working, um, there is help out there. Two is that um, we shouldn't make assumptions about anyone. And uh, at this point, I think the, the epidemic has changed such that I think most families know somebody who's struggling with addiction. But sitting here as a uh, mayor of the city of Providence, I'm someone who struggled with addiction. There are members of our community in every corner from all walks of life who have shared these same struggles and recovery is possible. And three, as a resident in Providence or a, uh, someone who works in the city of Providence, I think you should be particularly proud that we live in a city that understands that addiction is a disease, treats it as such, and is doing everything possible to try to help our community.
right we're good